So hello to everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here with you today. Me and my colleague Sika, we're going to be here today to co-moderate together the webinar Empowering Women in Water Perspective from the African Region. This is a very special webinar coming on the 8th of March, which actually commemorates today the International Women's Day. And uh, we are glad to be in the African region this year. So um, we, got, we hope that this webinar will bring you a lot of motivation and inspiration. Um, this webinar will address the gender gap in the water sector and advances the discussions, setting out specific proposals to increase and support women in the water industry. And together, we hope to celebrate women's achievement and increasing visibility while calling out inequality. I believe this is the key. Um, I'm gonna show you the next slide. The next slide is the way that we perceive this activity today and we try to empower women through our poster and donors to discover more concrete action and intervention to achieve a more diverse and inclusive wash sector. Why not reaching also SDGs? I'm gonna first introduce myself for everyone joining us and I can see so many people already are writing on the chat box. My name is Arginda Ibrahim Lari. I'm an environmental engineer. I've been previously working for a water utility in Albania. I'm recently located in Canada where I switched to a consultancy. And I'll be uh, co-moderating together with my colleague Sika. Sika, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar and happy International Women's Day. My name is Sika Radiova, and I'm a social anthropologist and diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist supporting underrepresented groups and communities. My main interest and expertise are in gender equality in the water and sanitation sector, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. Thank you, Sika. Um, I believe that there uh, is very important uh, to mention something about today's webinar. So Sika, if you wanna do some housekeeping here. Yeah, I can take you to quickly through the housekeeping. Uh, our webinar today is available in both languages, French and English. Uh, please, please pick the language that you'd like to hear. Uh, in your meeting webinar controls, uh, you can click the in interpretation bu button uh, on the bottom of your screen and click the language you would like to hear the webinar on. And it's optional to hear the, interpre uh, the interpreted language only. You can click mute original audio. This webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on IWA Connect Plus platform with presentation slides and other information. The speakers are responsible for securing copyright permission for any work that they will present of which they are not the legal copyright holders. The op opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentation and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Next slide, please. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on, um, on IWA Connect Plus. Following the webinar, you'll be sent a post-webinar email with the on-demand recording, presentation slides, and other information. Uh, we have chat box where you can uh, post general requests uh, uh, and um, activities and a Q&A box. Please use this one to send your questions to the panelists. So use the Q&A box if you have questions to the panelists that will be asked on the Q&A session. Uh, please note that uh, the microphones of attendees are muted and we unfortunately cannot respond to raise hand. Thank you, Sika. Thank you for um, the, uh, this information. I believe it's very important because we have uh, uh, countries that speak French as well, but English, of course, is the international language. And I can see on the chat area there are people uh, joining us from a different part of the world, even though this is a, a webinar which was addressed more regionalized in the African region. But it's um, very nice to have people from around the world because the issues are there and empowering women in the water industry are some um, 
or, or promoting the, this role of women in the water sector, it, it's common in uh, several regions of the world. Uh, the organizer of this activity today is the IWA International Water Association with the specialist group Sustainability in the Water Sector and AFWA, the African Water and Sanitation Association. And I'm going to go quickly to the next slides just to give you more uh, details about these two main organizers. The IWA specialist group on sustainability in the water sector. Uh, we try to put a screenshot on the slide for every one of you that want to know more about this specialist group. Um, you can go to the Connect Plus, the platform that IWA use for bringing the community that work, study, um, or want to learn more about water. Um, you just need to go there and find the specialist group page called Sustainability in the Water Sector. With the main goal that water use, for, for all water use to consider not only economics, but also social and environmental values and the future generation as well um, to all our co-residents on the planet. Um, I wanna make an announcement here. This specialist group um, has opened the nomination for uh, committee members and we are recruiting the deadline is the 31st of March. I'm really hoping that somebody from IWA can put the link on the chat. Um, in order to apply for this committee, uh, you need to become first member of the specialist group. It's easy, go to Connect Plus, just one button, uh, click on the specialist group, sustainability in the water sector. And if you really believe and think that you can contribute to our specialist group, Please apply by March 31st on the Survey Monkey link that is on the slide. But um, I can also send it to all of you on another email after this webinar. Next slide, please. For those who are wondering what is this specialist group and what we are doing, we have been focusing um, on four pillars, and we do have four subcommittees on that, sustainable use of water by industry, the SDGs, the digital work on, and professional development and training. Uh, this webinar today might be part of the professional development and training, but also of the um, sustainable development goals. It's a bit on all the, the four pillars that we uh, do work. We have done a lot of events. This webinar is uh, part of a series of webinar we started in 2021 with a global call for the empowerment of women internationally. Then we went more regionalized. We did last year the Latin America and the Caribbean, and this year it's time for Africa. Um, again, some of our activities uh, besides the webinars or the online activities that we do are different workshops. We just finished. Um, actually, it's like four months, five months now, uh, we um, finished the workshop, how the water industry can support women internationally in Copenhagen, Denmark, for the IWA World Water Congress and exhibition. And we are looking forward to the next um, event that will be again in Africa, which is the uh, World uh, Development Congress that will be held in Rwanda this year in December. Next slide, please. Now, a bit about our partner today. Our partner is the African Water Association and Water and Sanitation Association. That is a professional organization that brings together institution, companies, operators, and key professionals in the water, sanitation, and environmental sector in Africa. Here, I'm going to stop a bit because they have some amazing networks. Amazing. One of the networks that I want to mention, beside mayors, the young professionals, and PASA, or the Pan-African Sanitation Actors, is the women professionals. Uh, if you go to the next slide, about this network, you can see the countries that are part or belong to this network. There are 16 countries of existing women, 16 women professional network in WASH. And I'm really hoping that till uh, the next development Congress in Rwanda, this network will be expanded. The partner, this partner, AFWA, has been one of the biggest supporters of our uh, specialist group sustainability in the water sector. We have been collaborating together with different events, and we are glad that we joined forces today celebrating the International Women's Day on this webinar. Next slide, please. Now look at this beautiful picture. I'm honored, um, I would say it full mouth, I'm honored to have five 
distinguished speaker with us, representing different regions in Africa, different backgrounds, all women working in the water industry. For a long time now, the crucial role women play in management and conservation of water at the domestic and community level has been recognized, but especially women and girls in Africa bear the brunt of water collection, often from long distances, sometimes in very difficult circumstances, and also use usually bear responsibility for household hygiene and sanitation needs. But yet women make let make up less than 70% of water sanitation and hygiene labor force. And just a fraction of it, they are part of the policymakers, regulators, management, and technical experts. The reason why we want to do this webinar today, we started sending a survey globally about the role of women uh, in the water industry a couple of years ago. We got some responses from uh, around the world. Actually, most of them, 80% of them, there were women. Uh, based on their responses, uh, we created the agenda of today. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'm gonna show you some learning objective quickly. So through the webinar, we're gonna identify barriers and opportunities related to diversity and inclusion of women in the water industry in terms of not only hiring them but supporting their ability to maximize their contribution identify actions and interventions that can be applied by water and sanitation organization to promote a more diverse workforce and a more inclusive working environment to develop ideas to personally overcome current barriers and contribute to a more supporting work environment for themselves by applying the experiences and knowledge or from the presentations, and in the end, to gain awareness of new and innovative approaches from the discussion that we hopefully gonna have. Next slide, please. So I mentioned at the beginning today is the International Women's Day, and the theme of the International Women's Day for this year, 2023, is embrace equity. Let us know what does this mean for you. We gonna check later on probably or IWA staff can also do this your responses please share by using the hashtag IWA women leaders and break the bias on Twitter or on all other social medias that you do use we hope to have an inspiring event here and I'm sure we'll have after you'll hear our speakers next slide please so quickly the agenda of today We'll have five speakers on the call. The three first, we're gonna share experiences from their own country and from their own experience. After the first panel, we'll give the floor to the audience. So I can see the chat uh, is already um, working very, very well. So I'm expecting for you to pose your question addressed to each of the panelists. And I would suggest if you have a direct question to each of them, please uh, name, uh, the speaker that you want to pose that question on the chat area. We're going to check your question and we're going to ask those questions to our panelists on the Q&A session. And again, the, pan the second panel will be with two other, will be comprised by two other speakers from Kenya and Egypt in this case. After that panel, again, we're going to have Q&A. Uh, and again, we're going to ask your contribution and your question to our speakers. And in the end, we'll have a general discussion and Q&A uh, discussion by closing with final remarks. So let's start. Sika, you wanna again yes, mention? Um, so for the participants that haven't gone to the beginning because it was very early on, I'm gonna read this slide again. The webinar is available in French and English. Please pick the language that you'd like to hear. In your meeting webinar uh, controls, click interpretation and choose the language you want to hear the webinar on. And it's optional to hear, uh, to hear the uh, interpreted language only. Uh, click mute original audio. And just one quick correction, Linda. Uh, if you can, please post your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. <laughs> Correct. Because that's going to be the one that's in the chat box. It's more for introduction and general discussions. 
Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So uh, for the one that do have this version of Zoom with a Q&A and a chat, Q&A is for questions only. If you want to chat, there is a chat box, chat on the chat box. Yes, I apologize for that. Thank you, Siga, for correcting me. Thank you. Uh, okay, next slide, please. We will start with the experiences from the Democratic Republic of Congo we have today with us, Shatein Juma. Shatein is an ambitious climate water activist from the Democratic Republic of Congo with a professional background in sustainable agriculture production. She holds a bachelor degree in agriculture from Kenyatta University in Nairobi and she is a candidate, a Master of Science candidate at the University of Western Australia, where she will be pursuing a Master of Science in Soil and Water Conservation. Um, Shatane, the question for you. Shatane, uh, being a young water professional with more background in agriculture, what is uh, your experience and the challenges that you had for entering the water field? Are more men predominant in this sector? Will be nice to hear from your perspective, of course, also if you can mention something from the D Democratic Republic of Congo, but also Africa overall. What are your ways and advice of finding advancing in water industry? Thank you very much, Alinda, and uh, greetings to everyone. So uh, as Alinda has just mentioned, I have a uh, my background in agriculture, but uh, I was very lucky to join the water sector and I'm not regretting it. And that was in 2019. And um, I do remember that a friend of mine, uh, we were going to the university and the friend of mine suggested a lot of meeting on, on uh, it was most of the time on Friday or Saturday and we used to go. So um, during those meetings, we had to notice that uh, the water sector, and especially in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there was, there was not a lot of young people who were active in professional chapter in the GRC, and we got in touch with the IWA as well as um, the AFWA, the African Water Association. And from there, we started as a group of five, and by now we are almost 80 active young members around the uh, around the country so um through um through different meetings that we had for capacity building with afwa iwa and activities that we did uh, on the ground with our chapter we were able to gain our first knowledge in the i was definitely able to get uh, my first knowledge in uh, the water sector and I was exposed more on the ground in the activities that we're doing, uh, sensitization activities, uh, attending uh, attending conferences uh, in the wash sector, sharing my experiences with other young people uh, around the world, as well as uh, being panel in a big a panelist in big conferences uh, also, and. Uh, Thanks to also IWA specialist group of uh, agriculture, I was able to get my first job. <laughs> uh, uh, and now I'm working with a UK, uh, UK non-profit organization and that was through the... Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry for that. So uh, as I was saying, I was able to get my first job. And uh, from there, I was also I was able to be nominated as a country coordinator for COI 16, uh, which is a conference of the youth for the UN. And it is, it is an activity that always come before uh, the conference of parties on climate change. So um, those, I think, were my, my, were my success as for now in the in the wash sector, but the, 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 the way was not very easy. And um, during my short time in the wash sector, I was able to face also uh, some challenges. The first one being access to teaching materials. As I've mentioned, I'm not from the wash sector and uh, it was a bit complicated uh, being 
able to try to to teach other young people uh, some things in the wash and myself i'm also learning the same and um, from the democratic republic of congo when we started uh there was not like uh, in the university there was not uh, like a sanitation program or also a water engineering program nowadays they've started uh, uh materials as well as knowledge the second one will be access to local mentors i know we were very lucky definitely to be working with iwa also afwa but uh the reality of the wash sector in our country uh was and probably still a part that we don't master very well because we don't have a lot of ma uh, a lot of mentors who are trying to help us uh, trying to understand more on what is going on the other one was also uh, not being involved in decision making now decision making for me personally was very hard because of the age probably that one i know because they always tell me you don't have experience you are too young for this and other sometimes also you are a woman what can you do when we go on the ground are you able to do this are you able to do that so those were some types of di discrimination that i had to go through and sometimes i'm still going through them but uh, i believe now that people are starting to understanding that gender equity is an non-negotiable human right some people are still making very good steps toward resolving those problems the other one for me and uh, i think for my chapter which is our biggest barrier will be language i'm one of the luckiest who is able to speak english and to read uh, my my colleagues some of them are not able so even the teaching materials or the reviews that we receive from IWA from other platforms are not well exploited by the rest of the group because we, we are still limited uh, in terms of language. I think uh, I also have to mention that uh, for me personally, I had the period and sometimes I still have this because uh, as I mentioned, I'm not from the sector, so it's a bit complicated to know what to say. Is what I'm saying right with what is being thought out there? Like, is the knowledge that I have enough for me to try to spread the gospel about sanitation, to try to, to talk about access to water? So from time to time, I do, uh, I do face that as uh, an issue. And uh, I think I'm going to conclude by saying that um, our chapter also is still facing lack of access to funding. So for us, we are not, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, members who are working. Uh, most of us are still students and uh, it's a bit complicated for all of us to access or to try to, uh, to finance our own activities while a lot of us are not working. So, uh, but we've tried some grant application and up to now, we have been able to, to succeed, to get one, but hopefully like uh, banks or bodies that are help young people, that empower young people in the wash sector who are listening to us today here can try to see how to help us uh, through that process. Because I do believe that even if we're small, the small step that every small group is doing also counts toward achieving SDG 6. Thank you, Alinda. Thank you so much, Shatain. Um, coming from a young water professional, Shatain um, sits on the IWA steering committee of the young water professionals. She is representing somehow the young generation in this call. And um, I would thank her because she really mentioned some good points here, like language barrier. And we are very happy that we, we did provide this time a translation in French. But um, well, she also mentioned uh, the importance of um, volunteering and joining the forces with organizations uh, worldwide. Um, I'm going to do some questions later on, hopefully, if I have time and if uh, others uh, do not have any question. But I guess you'll have question for Shatein. She really made some good point. I'm going to uh, introduce the second speaker on the call. 
Geraldine Mpuma Logmo. Um, Geraldine um, is from Cameroon. She is graduated from the School of Journalism in Lille, France in 88. She holds a master in journalism, information and development option with uh, over 30 years of communication uh, experience. She started a career as a journalist in Cameroon, but today she is the communication and public relation manager at the Cam Cameroon Water Utility Corporation or CamWater. Actually, she also keep two very important um, roles or position with AFWA. Since February uh, 2019, she is the president of Specialized Management Committee of the Scientific and Technical Council of the African Water Association. And she's the president of Association of Professional Women of Water and Environment of Cameroon and French speaking coordinator of the Network of Professional Women on Water and Sanitation for Africa. Geraldine, the question to you is discrimination at work that may occur between colleagues, employees, employers, or between an employee and a third party, maybe a contractor, maybe a customer, maybe a client. Have you ever um, experienced disrespectful or discriminatory behavior connected to gender equality during your career in the water field? And if yes, what type? Uh, how did you deal with that? Tell us more um, about uh, your experiences or any advice that you could have on this topic. Merci, merci, Alinda. Bonsoir, tout le monde. Thank you, thank you, Alida. Hello, everyone. Yes, I wanted to say that discrimination is uh, uh, out there. It uh, exists in uh, what uh, uh, companies, uh, and you have it everywhere outside the water utilities in our communities. Uh, uh, in my career, I have faced such discrimination. It happened to me. But the one I wanted to say from onset sometimes is so subtle. Uh, it's, it's something which you cannot see. It is, uh, it is not something that you face uh, just uh, uh, on spot. So when you look at discrimination, you see women, uh, men, employee, employer, or among employees themselves, or between uh, disabled people and uh, people that are in good health. It can take many forms, uh, many shapes. Uh, my testimony regarding what I went through to start with is uh, discrimination in the company uh, because I was not an engineer, you know, uh, normally um, in the top management in the executive branch in uh, the we have a lot of engineers uh, most of them are men they, and you are very few women there uh, uh, when i was recruited in this area i was not an engineer but i was lucky enough uh, because i was uh, recruited directly as director i came as a communication director so really I couldn't face a discrimination as such because of my position, but I felt it uh, at the time. I had to negotiate my working contract. I had uh, an interview with the DG at the time, who was managing the company, and I was giving him my salary uh, proposal and suggestions to say, no, you cannot have such a salary. And he told me, I said, why? He said, because you are not an engineer. But I said, I have a long and rich career, and I guess this is why you are recruiting me. Maybe I am not engineer in waters and forestry and civil engineering, but in terms of communication, I am an expert. I already had 30 years or, or 25 years career. I already worked for the UN as consultant and many other institutions. So I, I said, so I said, I want this salary, I deserve it, and I want that salary. And uh, this is how they surrendered, they gave me the salary. So it's a form of discrimination for me. Beside this, in the reform of the water sector, could you please mute your microphone when you're not speaking for the sake of interpretation? So uh, I went in a private company, which is a, a public company for water utility, and uh, uh, and uh, Cameroon has decided uh, to re to reform the sector. They decided to merge the public company and the 
um, private company, and this is the company where I am today. We had uh, employees coming from the former from the company and the new company. So I have to say it was very complicated to put together, merge the two type of stuff from two companies with people that were duplicated on in each position to communication director, to operations, to technical director. So they also I had to face certain type of discrimination, not forcibly gender discrimination, men, women, but also with regard to two companies that were supposed to uh, merge. And the solution that I advocated at the time, because uh, as in my capacity of uh, communication director, I told the DG at the time, we should go into a, a process of change, uh, proceedings of change, so that people can understand that are coming from one different company, uh, from different companies. So this is how we started the conduct of change on team building uh, and work together, make sure SDG goals are put forward and work on the same, the same vision and go away from men issues or human <coughs> issues. We forgot to the lack of respect because this is uh, uh, another part of the question that was raised to me. I have to say it is worse, worse because we are women we are in a company that are led by men. We, uh, this is the, even the reason why we set up the network, the reason why we set up the women network. We needed to be heard. We go to a meeting, women, women will not talk, men only will talk, 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 and not because they don't have anything to say, because they are afraid and they were not even willing to take the floor and uh, some were not even giving us the floor. One director was even cutting, uh, taking the floor from me. I said, come on, suffer, uh, suffer. Let me finish, uh, bear with me, let me finish speaking. And then if you don't agree, we can see. I think that uh, it was not sexual. We didn't have, we had some harassment, not sexual harassment, thank God I did not face sexual harassment, but professional harassment. We faced professional harassment. As a woman, you always face such things. These are required, you have requirements, lack of patience, what people tolerate with men, they don't tolerate with us, we should do more because we are women. Maybe at the end of the day, uh, because we don't have enough time, I wanted to share, as far as I'm concerned, what can uh, be of uh, assistance. I think we should work on the confidence of women on their own trust. They should not pressure themselves too much. They should accept to make mistakes. I don't know why we women, we are afraid of making mistakes. This is part of apprenticeship. We need, we need to train. We need to train and we need to be updated, be part of networks. This is really assisting in terms of mentoring and coaching. And we need some role models. We need some mentors. And the best mentors that I had are men. I had some mentor, uh, gentlemen that have assisted me to better understand them and to better defend them. So we do have champions. Uh, we need to really uh, focus on work and skills. Don't pressure yourself too much. Give yourself time to uh, learn and, and uh, be imposed. Uh, so I wanted to thank you and uh, I will take whatever question comes to me gladly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Merci. Thank you so much um, for sharing your experience with everything that you mentioned. Thank you for pointing out salary gaps. Thank you for pointing out discrimination by position. Thank you for pointing out professional harassment. Um, you concluded with we need champions, we need role models, and you already are one for us. So thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, I'm going to take question for you in a second moment. Now I'm going to introduce the third speaker for this first panel. And she is uh, Maggie Mumba from Chuane University of Technology. And I'm going to read her bio. She is a full research professor at Chuane University of Technology and a South African National Research Chairholder of Water Quality and Wastewater Management. She conducts research activities on various aspects of water, 
with an emphasis on drinking water purification and wastewater management, health-related water microbiology, bioremediation, and pollution preventive measures. So Maggie, being a full research professor in the university, but also a shareholder, um, what can you consider high-level positions? Are those two the highest level position in the water industry? Uh, what is your experience on reaching those positions? Have you, um, did you experience any challenge on the re reaching those positions? Was it easy? Uh, was it easier for you uh, because you were coming par part of the academia? How is all this experience on uh, jumping the career ladder? Thank you, Arlinda. And uh, thank you for everyone who joined us today and for the opportunity that you are giving me today. Yeah, um, I want first to ask my, myself a question. Why do I choose to pursue this path? There are many reasons. The first one is thinking about the greatest challenge of sustainable development, which include the quality and the quantity of our water resources. And the second one, we have to know that this is among the objectives of improving health and living conditions and ensuring equitable as well as sustainable use of natural resources and a better life for all. And I choose to pursue this path to address the challenge of securing adequate water, clean water, developing strategies, which will improve water quality and quantity and eradicate waterborne diseases. This is possible only through capacity building and technology transfer. That is why I committed my whole life 32 years for technology, capacity building and technology transfer. One story quickly I can give to you. When I was small in my mom's house, I saw the worms coming from the tape. And I say, what is going on? The worm coming from the tap water that they have already um, treated. And I got the answer. And the answer comes from myself. When I did my PhD on the bowel feelings, means that those microorganisms, they attach on the pipe material and they cover a film and they grow. Even when they inject the chlorine or any disinfectant, they can't disappear. And when the, the film breaks, all oh, those microorganisms uh, fall in water. And this helped me really to deal with those microorganisms. And I focus, as you said, on uh, health-related water microbiology, antibiotic uh, resistance, bacteria, antibiotics, resistant gene, and water and wastewater treatment, bioremediation, biotechnology. And I wanted to in, in, innovate some technology, and I did. So I reached that objective. But what are the obstacles? Because in everything we do, there are always challenges. And what are the challenges that I went through all of this? As a woman, my career journey has been characterized not only by success, but with a lot of challenges. The first one, the environment that I've been working was not conducive for women. I became the first uh, professor in one university. I'm not going to give the names of a university because I worked in different universities. And being there, it was a total sabotage of my life, my experiment. And once even, I collected the sample, I put in the incubator in order that to see the growth of microorganisms to the heterotrophic plate count. And I found, I put the temperature at 28 degrees Celsius and I found the rays, someone came and raised the temperature at 78. And all microorganisms, they were dead. I cried, and with this frustration, I even burnt my hands 
because when I was very angry, very annoyed, and when I was preparing the media and I was thinking about this, and I bent my hands and they took me to the hospital. The second one, Danai, from male colleagues to accept the establishment of postgraduate program in water by a female. One of the universities I went to, there were not a lot of men, a lot of them. So the starting of postgraduate, and in that postgraduate, we started with honors. There were not honors degree. And I started the program. And when I started the program, it was a big issue for me. I couldn't establish that as a woman. So the atmosphere was characterized by querel, hatred, jealousy, discussion all the time. And even when I went to the municipality, because I wanted to train the municipality in one university, it was a rural university. And in that university, I found that uh, those who were treating the water, they were not able to know even the coagulation, the flocculation, the disinfection, all the chlorine demand. I commit myself to train them. But it was a big, big issue. It was a big issue. Men, they didn't like a woman to train the process controller. So what are the lessons there? Opposition always takes place wherever success prevails. But no one can stop you to achieve your destiny if you have courage, determination, and especially God on your side. Third, the most important one is the happiness can't come without pain. You have to suffer in order to be in a high level. Do not give up, Please persevere. Do good, work hard to achieve your goal. And we were born to leave some legacy. And that is what we have to fight, to leave legacy in this world. As a researcher, what to do? You focus on whatever you want to do, have a strong personality, avoid spending time with people who don't contribute to your success, seek for funding by planning to conceptualize ideas, be project leader, design methodology, achieve the goal of your project. Attending conferences, symposium, congress will offer you opportunity to knowledge on your field. Enroll students and try to publish with your students once they have the research result, because there is a saying stating that without publication, you perish. That is the academic world. And do not work in isolation, seek collaborator in your field, don't let anybody to bully you, to put you uh, down. My quote is, women in the water sector need to believe in themselves by focusing on technical innovate, innovative solution to improve lives through community engagement. Do not underestimate yourself. Thank you, Arlida. Thank, thank you so thank much, you Maggie. Business. Thank you okay. so much for telling your story, how everything started with you and your career, the obstacles, the challenges that you have, the first sabotage that you have, but you did it. You are here with us today telling the story of women working in academia and uh, progressing in their career. And I'm really hoping as well that we can have some question also from students um, that still study um, or, or do research on how to progress the, uh, as a woman in this water industry. You already mentioned some good points. Um, don't let anyone bully you. Um, and I'm gonna uh, switch now with, um, uh, the first panel, I'm going to give the floor to Sika so she can um, introduce the, the session of the Q&A. Thank you very much for this inspiring presentation uh, from our first uh, panel. 
Uh, I would like to ask uh, one question each panelist from the first panel. Uh, that's the time we have for now. We have quite a few in the Q&A box and apologies that we might not get to all of them verbally, but the panelists will try to answer in writing or we're going to send post-webinar materials that will try to answer these questions that uh, will be left unanswered. Uh, for now, I'm going to ask Shatane a, a first question. With different ongoing conflicts in uh, Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, what do you find is the impact on access to water and sanitation facilities? Uh, thank you very much for this question. And uh, I think I'm very glad to answer to that because I do live in the place where the, con the conflict is happening. I live in Goma and uh, the situation is really bad. And uh, when I'm saying the situation, I don't only mean like peace, but when we're talking about sanitation and uh, access to water, um, it's actually getting critical with uh, people who are coming from different villages to come to the town and uh, try to see if they can even get a shelter here. Our, uh, our national body that help with access with water, Régie des Eaux, is not able to meet the supply. And uh, with, with that supply not uh, that is not met, uh, it's a bit difficult for us to access water to drink, want water for other uh, other activities like use uh, in the house, and sanitation is getting out of hand. Uh, I believe I know that before this uh, this crisis, we were at least the cleanest city in the country. But now I'm not sure I can say that again because we have a lot of people on the street with people with no shelter there are people defecating here people like throwing uh, throwing their garbage everywhere so it's really getting out of hand but um we hope that things are going to get better and that authorities local one as other people who can help are going to help us with that thank you very much Aten, for your insight very helpful my next question is for Geraldine, and I would like to ask, as a professional in communication and as a journalist, how do you communicate the topic of discrimination, and especially how do you communicate it to men? Merci, merci pour la question. Effectivement, je pense que uh, la communication, elle peut aider beaucoup. Et Thank aide you for the question. Aider. I think that communication mm -hmm. can assist a lot, and is even assisting a lot. I think that I was hearing some English for saying that communication and the work we are doing is and mainly uh, communication uh, with, uh, the, in fact, is communication, social communication is what I'm talking about internally. Uh, which is targeting the colleagues already and the top management. What we are doing generally uh, is workshops, internal workshops. And one of the recommendations that I made and I wanted to make is that uh, most of the time we have cultural issues. We are same colleagues of a company in the same uh, country, but from different horizons. Uh, you may be from different tribes in the south and uh, the, you have the behavior and the culture. Uh, this is why you may have some issues sometimes. Uh, in the north of Cameroon, we all know uh, the uh, Fulani people, women don't, ha women don't have the same weight, are not addressed uh, to in the same manner are not treated in the same manner and most of the time we have to face uh, this type of situation and we need to work on this in our communication we also have uh, a series of activities that we suggest to uh, build teams for instance uh with regard to women's day in cameroon we organize a uh, a, a week of sensitization and uh, we invite men so that they can hear our issues. We have some seminars, some workshops and discussions. Uh, thanks to technology, 
uh, we can have some webinars. Uh, even though we are not together, we communicate, we stand together, we don't exclude anybody. Sometimes women close up to make to have activities together and they exclude men. We need to include them. We need to find champions around us. And uh, we can send some messages uh, towards those who can have some discriminating behaviors or disrespectful behavior. Communication is at the heart. And I have to say, personally, this is what has allowed me to overcome. Uh, to, uh, we need to talk to uh, the engineers and to all the uh, categories, all the fabric, uh, to the top management. And this will make you establish a linkage. And uh, I have the, the communication is the tool that will make us uh, bridge uh, and uh, create contacts. It's very important. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Very important matter. Merci beaucoup, Geraldine. My next question is for Maggie. We have quite a few, but I, I'm just going to pick one for now. Hopefully, we're going to have a bit more time later on for more questions. But I would like to ask Maggie, have you been involved in any women-led initiatives? For example, initiatives that combine technical solution with improvements in governance and community engagement in water governance. It will be really useful for the audience to get to know more about it. I've been working on this because of the time I couldn't elaborate all of this. I even have photos, nice photos that I group the women in rural areas because my uh, area of research, I focus on rural communities. And with these rural communities, I work mostly with women in order that to teach them technology. We developed um, uh, some technology that the bucket system, how you can treat your water through the bucket system. And I worked with those rural, the, the women in rural communities until they, have, they were able to have their own uh, water. And when we did, and that uh, experience, two years, we noticed that the reduction of the diarrhea went to 95%. Children, they didn't have diarrhea anymore. And it was a really a good experience. And with the government, I always, when you go to my Google Scholar, you found the guidelines that I have made for the government on uh, water treatment, on the diagnostic uh, norms that they can use in order that to bring the treatment of water. And now I have even developed some web tools that uh, for antibiotic resistance, how we can do the surveillance of the antibiotics coming from hospital and all of these we give to the government because the government, the, the people who give as my funding, comes from the government. So I have to work hand in hand with the government to give them back the technology that they need to improve the life of the community. And also on the training of the student. The student always, we work always with the uh, uh, drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment control processor. And we teach them those new technology, how they can improve uh, the technology for the treatment of uh, can be drinking water or wastewater treatment or drinking or wastewater treatment. That is. Thank you very much, Maggie. So I think uh, I'm going to hand back to Linda um, to present our second panel. And yes. hopefully after that, we get back to more questions. <laughs> I already have question for the three other panelists, but uh, let let finish the second panel. And there, if there is time, I'm going to ask the question on the Q and A. Some very good questions over there. Uh, I'm going to stop now to experiences from Kenya or, in this case, our speaker Leonita Sumba. Uh, Doctor Sumba is the chairperson of the Women in Water and Sanitation Association in Kenya. She is a former CEO of Kenya Water Institute, where she also served as a lecturer and researcher. She holds a PhD in biology, a master of science in parasitology, and the certificate in basics of decentralized wastewater treatment 
with a postgraduate diploma in IWRM. So um, the question here for you, it would be uh, a bit specific. The relationship mentor-mentee can help in many ways. Uh, we already heard some examples that we need a mentor in our life, but um, dealing with workplace difficulties, the goal setting, this career transition, uh, the mentor can, also, can be a supervisor, a trainer, a teacher, a friend, Based on your experience and your rich career path, can you please share any um, personal experience or views on being a mentor, but also being a mentee? What values and benefits did it brought to you? So thank you very much, Alinda. I'm delighted to be on this panel and I'm going to share with the, the audience my story. And my story begins with my family. That is at the beginning, I'm a second born. I have three brothers and two sisters. I'm surrounded by the boys. My parents were civil servants, my mother, a primary school teacher, and my father, a technician. My path had already been cleared, so there was no question of whether I would go to school or not. And there was no discrimination between the girls and the boys. We were all treated equally or equitably, if you like. And why do I say this? I say this because it was not the norm then, and it's still not the norm in some African families. So as a child, I went to a mixed kindergarten. My first year of primary school was in a mixed day school. And then from seven to 18 years, I attended girls only boarding school. So for me, competition was with my equals, the girls. At the university, I became aware of some subtle differences among female and male students. I saw some of my female classmates struggle to balance their education, starting families. The biological clock was ticking. For me, that was the least of my concerns. Nothing was going to stand in my way. I had a strong family support, as well as scholarships to pursue my education to the highest level possible. In fact, my father advised me to do all the studying that I wanted to do while I was still in his house. That was my number one mentor and my male champion. My mother was my number one female supporter. So my entire work life has been very eventful. I've experienced many phases of growth interrupted with episodes of challenges. I worked in a male dominated organization where we were only three women among the technical staff. One was an engineer, another a geographer, me, a biologist. There were no senior female colleagues to mentor me. I had to find my space. At one point, I found myself at a place where I didn't seem to be advancing my career. I was left with three options, to quit, to stay on, and let time sort out things, or wait for my retirement, or reinvent myself and progress. So I chose the latter, to reinvent myself. In this part of the world, you don't have many options anyway. I had to fight off a bit of discrimination, intimidation, and all manner of harassment from some of my male and female colleagues. My numerous efforts towards stemming sexual harassment were not taken very seriously, both at senior management and at board levels. I strongly believe that sexual harassment can lead to other individual barriers like fear, and lack of confidence which affect career progression among women. As an older senior woman, I saw many young, younger women, students on internship and attachment go through harassment at work from people who should be mentoring them anyway. With promises of employment and promotion, you know, this was happening. I did not stand by and watch. What did I do? I helped to develop the first institutional gender-based violence and sexual harassment policy. Looking forward, I would really like to see a watch sector that is diverse, inclusive, and a sector that provides a safe environment for women and students to thrive. I have had many mentors, or I have many mentors, and people I learned from through their writings. A book by Robin Sharma, the leader who had no title, has taught me to lead even if I have no formal position of influence. Another by Simon Sinek, Leaders It Last, has taught me to sacrifice what is mine and to save what is ours. And that means growing other leaders. That means mentoring 
and that time mentoring my students and now mentoring younger women and making them at least grow and uh, clearing the path for them. On water resources, protection and conservation front, I take a leaf from the late Professor Wangari Madai. And when my job as a CEO came to not so good ending, the book by Dr. Wale Akinyemi titled Help, My Chocolate is Melting came to my rescue. I learned to turn the melted chocolate into something useful. In that regard, I would like to share with you the words from Dr. Wale as told to him by his mother. When a chicken lays an egg and you take the egg, does it cry? Oh. What does it do? It lays another egg. So instead of crying when I lost my job, I asked myself, Lunita, do you still have eggs in you? Yes. So what is stopping you from laying more eggs? I moved on and I've kept laying many more eggs. I am an early riser. As a young girl, the only way I knew that would make me succeed was getting ahead of others. To me, that meant getting up earlier than my classmates. I still believe that the early bird catches the worm. I also believe that to be outstanding, you have to stand out. So I always try to stand out. My story ends with an appeal to the women in wash sector. You need to believe in yourselves, your capabilities. Look around us, humanity, and in particular, Africa is faced with a lot of challenges. Identify your niche. I have identified water pollution and lack of safe sanitation, and I'm doing something about it, however little. As we are all aware, women and girls are the most affected when water and sanitation are lacking. I am pushing for changes in policies, practices, attitudes, and mindsets in my activities. Challenge yourself, brand yourself, then equip and present yourself for opportunities. Find resources from your mentors and networks. You can overcome any stereotypes, cultural, and workplace barriers. And if you look carefully, you'll find the great examples you can emulate. Even outside your workplace, the ball is in your court. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Leonida. This is really inspiring. Thank you really for mentioning that um, you can start with a mentor within your family. It doesn't really need to be and to have that professional background if you are looking for that, but to have that self-confidence needed, you can find your mentor just within your circle. And thank you for also mentioning that reinventing ourselves I know that it's difficult, that it's a challenge, but you can do that if you really believe uh, in yourself. Very inspiring. Um, more questions for Leonita, please write on the Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna continue now with our last but not the least speaker, experiences from Egypt. Ms. Maha Kalaf from the GIZ. She studied uh, science at the Cairo University with a Master of Science in Water Environment Management, Civil Engineering Department from Lowborough University in UK and another diploma on Business Administration from the University of AG with 30 years of management experiences in the water and wastewater irrigation, agriculture, solid waste management, environmental pollution prevention programs, Nexus project. Uh, she has been working for uh, several NGOs, including here USD, CEDA, and, and other um, operation uh, optimization programs. Now she's working for GIZ. We are glad that we have here today uh, another organization. My question to you, Maha, would be what is your vision of woman role in water? You are a mom, but you are also a project manager with such a huge experience. So working um, or having this professional career, but also uh, having your kids at home. How do you balance profession and family life? Is this sector we are all involved encouraging women to achieve a career in the water sector? Thank you very much, Alinda. Uh, I would also like to extend the thank to Renita. Her speech was absolutely encouraging. It made me smile. It made me also reflect on what we are all uh, living through. Um, 
let's talk about the sector first in a brief that um, in the water sector, uh, when I started my work, I was always addressed as Mr. Khalif. Nobody could recognize that uh, a female would be working in a water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant. And the first comment I received when I was doing some capacity building in a wastewater treatment plant was, could USAID not send us something better than a girl? Of course, for me, as a young um, a lady who was very ambitious to work in this sector, I was sort of, no, I'm, I'm not really hearing this, but I did, yet I pursued my career. But let's reflect on, to be able to take different roles, you have also to be offered some chances. So let's reflect on how does the society uh, perceive um, a lady in the area where I live, in the Arab-African region. Um, if you are a young lady and looking to, to pursue your education in engineering, the first thing you're told, this is difficult. It's very practical. It will hamper your opportunities to have a married life. So it will disencourage many females. If you are courageous enough and enthusiastic enough to go on to university and study engineering and pursue it, then, and you would like to study a postgraduate abroad, you will be told, you know, if you do your postgraduate abroad, this will limit your chances in finding a husband. Because in this culture where I am, if you have a master's degree, you're expected to marry someone with a master's degree. If you have a master's degree from abroad, equivalent, equivalent to this, your, your husband or your partner should be someone with a master's degree from abroad, not to mention a PhD degree. So when I went to, do, um, to pursue my master's in England, I was told, be careful, it will limit your marriage chances. So it will limit my roles too, which is you know, alarming for many ladies. And if you start your work, the question is always, if you work at an international organization, can your salary in this culture be higher than the salary of your partner? I mean, there are always questions of, if I want to pursue this role, I am ready or am I prepared to take the challenge? Because men are always threatened if the wives have a higher salary than they do. And at least in this culture, this was a threat to my partner. And at one point you have to make selections. If you work in an international organization, sometimes your work requires you to travel and it will require you to leave your kids behind or to leave them uh, for someone else to take care of them. So there are always these questions about, you know, limitations that have um, an impact on what roles can you take? Can I take the role of, as an internationally recognized person? Can I pursue my education abroad? Can I work in an international organization? Can I seek high ranking positions that will give me a higher salary than my partner or not? Once you survive all these choices and you decide, yes, I would like to pursue it, I would like to have an, uh, a position in international organization, I would like to have all these chances that are open for me and use them, um, you have to live with the choices. You have to live with your choices, which is very interesting. And now I look back at um, all what I have been through and ask myself, um, what could I have done different? What should I advise, you know, in order to have all these rules as a working woman, as a mother, as a, a partner at one point of my life, as someone who also have hobbies that they would like to fulfill? What should I advise other ladies in order to be able to, to do all this and not give up a role because they fear this social boxing that is put on us? And now I have five pieces of advice for you. I will go through them very fast. Have mercy with yourself. Things are not meant to be perfect, but we are also, we also, we are also, women are in general perfectionist. And we also feel guilty that if the kid is sick, it's sick. My kid is sick because I'm a working woman. No, your kid is sick because all children get sick, not because you're a working woman. If the house is not perfectly clean, it's because I'm working woman. No, it's because sometimes every house is not perfectly clean. So have mercy with yourself. Have mercy with other female colleagues. My second piece of advice is, prioritize and select what cannot be replaced later. Sometimes we look at our to-do list and we say, this can be postponed. But remember, select the things and enjoy them that cannot be replaced later. Some things can be postponed but cannot be replaced. So think of what cannot be replaced later. A time with my children, a career opportunity. If it cannot be replaced, pursue it and then prioritize your list. My third piece of advice is delegate, delegate. There is so much that we can delegate now. I mean, just depend on other people and delegate. You can always have your stamp, you know, on the list that you delegate, but delegate, delegation works most of the time. My fourth piece of advice is 
the opposite of perfectionist is not that you're not perfectionist. The opposite of perfectionist is practical. Remember, sometimes if you're not a perfectionist, you're just practical and you pursue matters in an efficient way. So try to be practical. Last but not least, I'm trying to tell you that the fifth advice is when you go in your journey, take the whole you with you. We consist of different parts that make us happy. The mother part makes me very happy. The working woman makes me very happy. The part where I do my hobby of you know, designing jewelry or whatever you love, sport or art, whatever you love, also makes you happy. So when you pursue the journey, take your whole you with you. And when you take over a, part, a, a role, like the mother role, unplug the working woman and leave it in front of your house. If you're in your office, unplug the mother role and leave it in your house. And try to do this role that you're currently pursuing as best as you can in your perfectionist manner. But in your whole life, do not leave a part behind that will make you happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maha. Um, very important topic. We had so many reaction uh, from people that have the same, trying to still have the same um, difficulties on balancing professional life and family uh, family life. You gave some great examples. We're very happy to have you uh, today with us and receive those advices for you. Uh, I'm going to hand over again to Sika for a question addressed to our two last panelists, to Leonita and Maha. Thank you very much, Leonita and Maha, for this really inspiring and personal presentations, very valuable and, and real, quite emotional. Um, I'm going to ask each of you a question um, as well, like with the first panel. Uh, and Leonita, I think everybody was really enjoying your personal experience. So I'm going to ask a question to continue this topic. Uh, as being a chief executive officer and holding high leadership position, this requires high level of self-confidence and self-presentations. Uh, what are your key methods of achieving and improving it? And how would you advise young women in the sector? Thank you, Thank you Maha. Yes, being a, a CEO, you really need to be confident. And this confidence does, just doesn't come. You have to start building it from even when you're still at junior uh, position. If you remember my story, I said I had to reinvent myself. And that meant uh, doing a lot of volunteer, speaking up when I when nobody's saying something, you speak up, being visible, you know. So the confidence has come with time. And uh, I'm, I'm still not yet there, but it has come with, with, with time, trying to do something. So I, I, I would say the young people, if you have some doubts, do it. Just start. That is the first step. Whatever you want to do, just start. And the rest, I think, will flow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonita. Maha, I'd like to ask you, do you agree that women, especially women in Africa, are still underrepresented in the water sector? In one of our survey responses, it was mentioned that in South Africa, women still don't occupy a significant percentage of decision-making position in the water sector. Is this real? Can you, can you please comment on this? On this and, and do you think it's related to the difficulty to achieve culturally work-life balance? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and I totally agree. If I give you an example about Egypt, in the water sector in Egypt, you have 25 water and wastewater companies. 25 companies out of which would you guess how many are female chairman for this company? What would, you, what would be your guess? One female chairman out of the 25 companies. One female out of... Oh. It, it has never been more. And I had a chat with one of the decision makers in the sector. Why only one? Why not five? I mean, I'm not even talking about the 50% that you should assume because the population has 50% female. And the answer was like, um, they cannot stay late. I say, in medicine, they stay late. And in many of the other uh, disciplines, they do stay late. Women travel. So 
somehow it, women are underrepresented in the water sector, I assume it's not because of any challenging difficulties for the women to take the lead. It's just because there was no encouragement. Those who are making the decision to appoint women are not just convinced that the women are good enough, are equally good for this position. Unfortunately, I have to say, if I look at our own organization where I work in, you know, in international organizations all the time, how many women are leading projects, water projects, wastewater projects, agriculture projects, not even 25% of the, uh, the, the number would be female, even in international organizations. So I think as female leaders in the sector, we should encourage other female leaders, and we should also encourage the sector to change. Thank you very much, Maha. Such a lack of role models for young women, and thank you for being here and being one of them. Sika, if I can um, ask all the panelists uh, to open their video and be on a call. I'm going to ask to each of them one last question. I know that time is limited, but I have some very good questions for uh, from we have our quite audience. a few here. good questions here. Yes, so and I'm going to try. There are so many, but I'm going to really try to find uh, each of the speakers one question. And I'll probably start with Professor Momba. We have somebody saying that uh, somebody talking about also your, your uh, discipline. As a young upcoming researcher, the challenge is how can someone deal with a superior who is not so keen in supporting research in their department? So uh, what would be your experience? You are working in a university as a professor. Um, if, if this case happens, what, how do you respond? Please repeat again, my internet is unstable, so oh. I couldn't hear. Uh, I'm, I'm going to repeat it again. So we have somebody that says that my professor doesn't support my research, doesn't support my work in the university. Uh, what will be your advice, your, your question. piece of advice? Oof. No? Should I repeat it again? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna continue. Maybe I'm gonna try it again later, Maggie. Um, can you write it down? Maybe I can respond. I'll, I'll, I'll write it through the chat, and you can directly uh, directly respond there. Um, okay. One question. Maybe this is to all panelists, but. Um, do you believe that engineers in the water industry are at more advantage than scientists? Uh, do they hold high, um, higher positions? Um, ca can, you, can you give an example uh, of a balance? Uh, I know that you already mentioned, some of you already mentioned um, the, the salary gap and the fact that people were considered the, the one that are, well, they have this engineer background, they were paid more than, um, other uh, other backgrounds. Um, what would be here? Um, uh, how how can we change? It's not, of course, it's not in our uh, in our hand to to change the system. We cannot change directly and immediately by pressing a button the system. But we should start somewhere, probably by giving awareness uh, about this. Do, does someone want to answer to this question or to this comment? Um, Maybe um, Geraldine, because you were coming uh, in the water industry with a different background, and I, I think you were the one that you mentioned this kind of uh, position discrimination or background discrimination. Let's call it like that. Euh, merci pour la question. Elle est très importante. Ce que je voudrais dire en réalité, c'est que dans des Thank you for the question. It is very important. What I wanted to say in reality is that in companies such as Howard's, everybody has so, the possibility to be there uh, because somebody said we need everybody to make a world. You cannot only uh, build a company with engineers, only with uh, uh, biologists. You need everything to, to get together. I saw some engineers that were working pretty well, but when you needed to go in front of the uh, subscribers or the clients to explain things, they needed, they needed the people 
Donc, that en réalité, were scared il y that de matter so that the message can go through. So the is no way we should apply discrimination. Everybody is important. We need to find ways to put everybody together and work together. So that at the end of the day, we can uh, really uh, do things uh, in water and sanitation as we need to do. We need to work in order to abolish discrimination among engineers, biologists, uh, and where, whatever. There is room for everybody. Together, we can reach out to our goals. Thank you, Geraldine. A question here for, for Chatein. As a young water professional, you already mentioned the importance of volunteering. You already mentioned entering uh, or participating in different organizations. Uh, is, this, uh, is this important to do it in the international context or would you would suggest specifically to uh, young water professionals that already started to enter this um, industry starting locally? And when doing this kind of volunteering that you already mentioned, did you uh, experience um, women supporting women or men supporting women? How was your personal experience? Uh, thank you so much for the question, Alinda. So um, regarding the volunteering, uh, I think we have to start, I believe one of the panelists states, even if it's small, we have to start from where we are. So if you have access to uh, opportunities internationally, start there. But uh, on my side, I could, I could advise the local one because the local ones gives you at least uh, an idea and uh, somewhere to start so that you can grow big. International applications do require a lot of information than local ones. So for me, I think uh, the local ones will be the the simpler for us as young people, especially for African reality where every application requires you a number of years that you don't get even for, uh, for, for uh, attachment or even internship. So if you get the small one, I'm very, I'm very sure that the bigger one will be very easy for you to get because you will learn how to write, uh, you will probably sometimes you're going to fail or you are not going to get a response. But as much as you try, you are going to learn a few steps. And from those steps, you'll be able to apply to the, to the international ones. So I think for me, that was it. And um, regarding the women to women support, I think it was a 50-50 <laughs> on my personal uh, experience because I was very lucky uh, through the IWA to get connected with wonderful people. Jacobs, for example, he was one of the people who was behind me every time. No matter what you need to apply for this, you need to do that. And the more I did it, I was even able to get my scholarship for master's. So I'm very glad for that. And uh, for other women, you personally, there was Christine, Is uh, Isabella. There's a lot of people like I've been getting that support on the side of AFWA also. AFWA is really supporting us. And on the ground, uh, I think by now, we've understand that um, the, the, there is that we can't do it alone. So we, we've learned to, to rely on each other to open up to share opportunities because a lot of people don't share opportunities, but when you start it and other people try to reciprocate it, it is helping us move forward. Thank you, Shatein. A quick question for Maha. She started already mentioning a bit about um, uh, balancing the, the, uh, the professional uh, career and the, the family life. What would be a piece of advice for somebody also like me that uh, made the kind of interruption on their professional life because they had kids or babies and they want to re-enter now the water sector, but we have a gap of a couple of years, for, for instance. What would be your advice, your personal advice? Yes, thank you very much. It's very relevant to me. Uh, do not make the gap big, you know, because the bigger the gap is, the harder it is to enter the market again and to regain, you know, your expertise. It's also good, you know, it's always, you know, very tempting to to remain in the zone of I have kids, I enjoy them. And they're also very funny and, and, and nice to hug, you know, better than hugging a five. So do not make the gap big. Give, during this gap, 
keep yourself connected to the sector that you want to be in. So keep yourself with short-term assignments, keep yourself with any NGO work, any voluntary work, even if you're not paid for it, but keep yourself connected to this and develop yourself. Take this gap as an opportunity. So if you have to take care of the kids, develop your potential in this. So take whatever uh, courses uh, during this time, but make sure that when you re-enter the market again, you have something more to offer to yourself, not just to your employer. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate this. Um, I, I'm on maternity leave here uh, and I'm still doing a, a workshop or a webinar. So thank you so much. Uh, my last one, it will be Leonita. I'm going to send the question we have um, for uh, Maggie because she could not hear us. But uh, Leonita, we had so many comments from people that were inspired by your story that are asking, how can I met Leonita? How can I do an internship with Leonita? So my question is, would be, in your organization, in your place uh, where, where you work, um, do you have career development um, programs that you give to employees uh, or anything that you can share, uh, some examples of improving the opportunities for women working in the water industry? Maybe you can give some example from your working place or how you, how you do to promote women in water. So passionate like you are. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Linda. Uh, as you had said, I work for the Women in Water and Sanitation Association. I'm their chairperson. And this is a network of, of women uh, professionals or anyone who is interested in water. We have membership from, uh, uh, we have corporate membership. We also have individual membership. As long as you're interested in, you're a woman and you're interested in water, uh, we also admit uh, male champions. So we have male champions also uh, championing the cause for women. So how we do it is that these are women who have come together for a cause. So you come, you, you join viewers because you want to contribute to the well-being of the other women. So women for women for women. You know, we empower the, the women so that they can empower the society. So you come to and you bring your skills to the group, and then we build each other. So it's a forum for networking, a forum for doing good, a forum for helping others. So I'm welcoming the women in Kenya, because uh, right now it's, it's Kenyan. So I'm welcoming the women in Kenya to join us so that uh, together we can have that critical mass that will, uh, will speak to the issues that are affecting women and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonita, and thanks actually to all our amazing speakers today we would love to receive your answers from the question we have in the q a box and then we're going to send those questions to you later on um, if you can put the slides um Tika, on the screen i'm going to make some uh, quick summary let's say of what what happened today by the quotes from our speakers in your journey of life, value the whole you. Do not leave a part of you behind when pursuing another. Thank you, Maha, for that. Women need to believe in themselves and their capabilities. Then equip and present themselves for opportunities. They can overcome any stereotype, culture, and workplace barrier. Thank you, Leonita, for that. Women and youth need to be at the helm of water and sanitation sector to accelerate the SDG 6 goal. Every generation has its challenge, and ours consists of building an inclusive, equitable wash sector. And thank you so much, Shatane, for this inspiring quote. Next slide, please. Women in the water sector need to believe in themselves by focusing on technical, innovative solutions to improve lives through community engagement. Do not underestimate yourself. Thank you, Maggie, for that. Uh, I'm going to try to read in French. Uh, probably I might be wrong. I uh, saw so the translator need here to, uh, to do a better job. Pour les femmes, il n'est pas le chemin. For women, for women. Okay, you do that. Pour les femmes, il n'est pas de chemin sans embûche. A force de courage, de détermination et de résilience. For women, there is no way without barriers, but with courage, determination, and resilience, there is no barrier that we cannot overcome. Thank you so much, Geraldine. My French, it's uh, not good at all. <laughs> um, I wanted to conclude with the quotes from all our speakers, because that's the best summary I can do for this wonderful event we had today. 
platforms like IWA for discussing and debating issues regarding the role of women in the water supply and sanitation sector has been established. So we are here today because of that. And we need to do this more often to explore feelings, but also to obtain information about areas that we need attention. And we did this today by the inspiring story of our speakers. Making people aware of the past, present, and future realities about the role of women in the water sector is essential to the development of viable values that will guide, uh, guide behavior and allow the understanding of important issues. Um, before I'm going to upcoming uh, event, I just want to mention that expanding the women's talent pool and diversifying the workforce is a process which takes time and commitment to achieve results. Therefore, a lot more needs to be done to address the lack of gender diversity in the water sector. And this, of course, will require multi-level solution at national sector, but company and level organization too. Also, from our personal uh, level, and we just did this today. Um, Sika, if you want to say something before uh, concluding this uh, webinar and I show some upcoming events. Yeah, just want to conclude with, uh, with um, just mentioning that there are some key constraints that increase social and national level challenges, such as gender norms and stereotypes, occupational segregation, the low share of women graduating from science, technology, engineering and mathematics fields, the lack of enough role models in the sector and the nature of work. The work for equality depends on society in general. There are some women that are quite fine with staying at home with the kids, embracing the norms of the society they live in. However, as the, quali the quantity and content of the survey responses showed, we should really think of how professional life can be improved for those women who would like to combine family life with being a great professional, being supported and being heard. I believe this webinar was one step forward and let's, let us embrace equality and happy International Women's Day all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sika. Please share your thoughts on Twitter or all the social medias. You can find, you can find uh, the hashtag there. Uh, before going to the last slide, please go ahead to the first one. I just really want to mention the three upcoming events from IWA. Uh, the World Development C Congress and Exhibition that will be held in Kigali, Rwanda from the 10th of, and 14th December of this year. And I really hope to see you all there. There is a spe uh, the SG uh, Leaders Forum, the, the uh, Specialist Group Leaders Forum um, that will be in April. And for all the young professional, for all the students and all people just entering the water sector, there is the Young Water Professional Get Together, uh, the upcoming event on the 5th of April. So these are the three uh, next events for IWA. And for the one that are new uh, on this webinar, for the one that are not members of the International Water Association, we'll give you a coupon or a discount to become the newest member of the IWA. And I'll show you the code web 23 recruit for the 20% discount for new members till the 31st December of 2023 of this year. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, happy International Women's Day, uh, and uh, I really hope to get in touch with you. We're going to soon send you a kind of report of this webinar, and all the recording and the link will be uh, uploaded in the IWA website and Connect Plus. Thank you so, so much, and I really hope to see you soon all. Thank, Thank you, everyone.